Okay. Yeah, there's uh, Central Texas Mycological Society, which is us. Alabama has one that's really good. There's a lot. There's pretty much one for every region or state. And if there isn't, they probably have someone working on it. All right. Defining features. The easiest way to identify a mushroom will be by their macro features or features visible to the naked eye. And in the next section, we're going to go over some of these features. And hopefully I put enough colorful pictures in there to not bore everybody because it gets a little, a little verbose for some time. So one of the easiest ways to tell is by what type of spore bearing surface it has. So basically what type of mushroom. So gilled mushrooms are going to be agarics, fleshy with spore bearing gills that most people call mushrooms. Chanterelles and trumpets, fleshy with spore bearing wrinkles or ridges. Bolites, fleshy with spore bearing pores or tubes. Two polypores, which are tough to woody with spore bearing tubes or pores. Probably should put corky in there too. It's a wide range of how they can feel. Crust fungi, fleshy to tough, grows on a flat uh, surface, produces spores all over. Tooth fungi, fleshy to tough with spore bearing teeth. Coral mushrooms, fleshy to firm, and they produce spores all over. Did I skip that? Okay, now this is the second clue for the guess that mushroom and win a ID book. There's going to be a few in there that will give more features away throughout. Okay, so size and color. Size is an often noted but unmeasured feature uh, for beginners. Usually they can just say it's big, it was bigger than my hand, or they'll put your their shoe or a lighter next to it to give you reference. But you want to make sure to try and get the uh, cap width, stem length, stem width. And if it has pores or teeth or anything, you want to get the depth of those as well. And the color, you want to note the color of the cap or the pileas. Note the color transitions and their location. So is it red going to orange in the center or the opposite? Is there any transitions in there? Gill color, note the overall color and any variations such as splotchy colors or dissimilar colors on the gill edges. And for the stem, note the color from top to bottom, including any other features, rings, hairs, vulva reticulation, or rhizomorphs. I meant to correct that spelling on that one. Mm. Well. All right, so the cap shape, oh, on the wrong one now, applinate or plain, kind of like a plate, once it gets to a certain maturity, they're just pretty much flat. They can be conic, so cone shape, pointy on top, margin usually flared or not usually flared, and it's taller than it is wide. And we have convex, which is regularly regularly rounded, kind of like an upside down bowl, and it's usually wider than it is tall. Parabolic mushroom, like this uh, coprinus right here, regularly rounded, but much taller than it is wide. In fundibiliform, with a strong central depression, usually funnel-like. This is the only one I had that was like that. It was on upside down, unfortunately. But I have another picture that I'm going to comment on with that one. And if the cap is umbinate, it'll have a central bump or protrusion. The umbo can also be described as narrow or broad, depending on the diameter. And it's called cuspidate when the umbo is elongated. So there's this amanita from, I think, New Zealand. It's got some name that's similar to Gandalf. And it's got a long pointy hat and it's all shaggy. Mm -hmm. 
Campanulate, this is a somewhat bell-shaped with flared margin. The edge of the cap becomes upturned and a rounded apex. So it's not pointy like the conic one. It's a little more bell-shaped. Uh, that's a very common feature with species of Lusocoprinus. Or it can be depressed, having a central depression, which can be shallow or deeply depressed, as well as broadly or narrowly depressed, depending on the depth and diameter, respectively. And so, if, I'm sorry, do you have a question? No worries. So that one, it would be like this, but the whole margin or the whole cap is going to be upturned. And so it will be more funnel shaped. Um, they're, they're pretty similar. It just depends on how upturned it is. So the cap shape seen from the top, we have ovoid or round or circular. A lot of lactarius, russula, stuff like that will be in that shape. We have petaloid, and this one is a uh, Hohenibahalia petaloides, and it looks like an oyster mushroom, except it usually grows like petals where they're all concentric kind of instead of on top of each other. And dimidate, which is semicircular. I don't think anyone really uses that word. There's spathulate, which is shaped like a spatula. And that's a jelly fungus, a Dacryo pinax. A lot of them are kind of similar shaped. Concate, shaped like a shell. So that's going to be your oyster mushrooms and your oysterlings. Um, so I think that's like Lentinellus, Pluritus, probably a couple others. And flabiliform, shaped like a fan. There's another Dacryo pinax. So here we're going to talk about the margin, which is the very edge of the cap and different features it can have. So it can be printed or scalloped. So really, I'm going to put all three of these up. They have a different name for each one, and they're basically just going off of how far apart the gills are spaced because that pattern will repeat less or more depending on how, you know, if the gills are distant, subdistant, close, or, you know. But those are all three very similar. So an eroded margin is not going to be pretty, it's going to look like it has been weathered or it's falling apart. Appendiculate, it's going to have patches or pieces of partial veil silipat attached. And so this is a uh, candeliomyces, I think, and they usually don't have uh, a veil present on the stipe, but it is usually, well, I see two types. There's a very fuzzy one and a not so fuzzy one, and nobody can tell me the difference but they tend to just have it on the margin and not on the actual stipe itself. And remose, so like eroded, but with the regular portions that lead to radial splitting along the pileus. So this is very common among species like anosobe, uh, inosperma, and pseudosperma, or really anything in anosobaceae. We got one more clue. You can see the gills there, free. A little bit of pink on the stipe. Oh. All right, the margin surface. Striate that is having thin visible lines running radially, radial, eh, cannot speak today, radially along the margin. That's a uh, pretty common in species like Amanita in certain sections, um, certain sections black striations, uh, but I think section vaginata, uh, section amanita, I think. So they can be uh, translucently striate, which really only shows when the mushroom is fresh or moist. So if it's after a rain or it just grew, 
you'll see it. But then after it dries out, like this one is a, I believe, lactocolibia. And it turns to just like a plain white piece of paper after it's dried. Like you won't see any of those striations anymore. Uh, sulcate, the striations form grooves along the margin having depth, not just superficial. That's another feature of a uh, leucocopritis that is pretty common across different species. And plicate striate, having folds between the striae. So it's just like a little more intense, further developed striations. All right, surface look for the cap. They can look polished or shiny. Dull, not shiny, lacking any luster. Viscid. So that's going to be like a hygrosabi or a gliophorus, whatever they're all transferred over to now. And silky, in between shiny and dull. That one really is only shiny because of the little hairs on it. All right, and I believe these are more about textures. No, both. So this Rusula is going to have a dry cap. It's going to feel like there's not really any moisture on it. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. This is an Asperoinosibi, and they have sometimes hygrophanous caps. Uh, so as it dries out, the color is going to drastically change, and you'll be able to see a split in the colors from where it's dry to where it is still moist. And it usually dries from the outward in. And glutinous. So I think this is a limicella or something. Uh, extremely slimy, hard to hold on to, but having a coating of liquid like slime or glue on top. And lubricose, feeling oily or slippery. I guess I put those in the same one. The surface texture, it can be free of wrinkles, cracks, or pits. It can be scrobiculate, which is shallow pitting of the surface. And then there's, oh, let me go back. Alveolate and lacunose, those are basically two different uh, severities of scrobiculate. And I don't know if you can see it that well, but the same uh, appearance right here on the stipe, a little pitting, that'll appear on the cap as well. It's laconate. It's said to be splitting into segments. So you'll see that a lot with uh, Pluteus species, uh, deer shields. Uh, they'll start to upturn a little bit and then the surface dries and they'll crack in weird directions and you could pretty much just pull one segment off if you wanted to. Areolate, excessive splitting in all directions that results in a dried mud look. Uh, this happens a lot with different boletes. So I think this is a hortobaletus or a xerocamellus. It's a pretty common feature among them. And then rivulose and rugose, wrinkly lines, kind of like a river on a map. This is uh, an agrosibi. And they have one species, agrosibi retigera, and it is an extremely, I guess it's rugose cap. And it's a very interesting find if you ever find them. A lot of the other agrosibi that we have will look like that when they're young, but then it kind of fades away as they, they expand out their cap. And then Rimos splits extending past the cuticle, the outermost layer. I think I already had that one in there. So aside from just the surface texture itself, sometimes the pileus will have uh, hyphae growing on it into a certain form. So let's see what I say. They will orient themselves in different different ways, unlike the previous slide, the following will pertain to textures on top of the surface and not the texture of the surface itself. 
So these features can be said to be either superficial, having a feature that does not persist with age. So the warts on the Amanita, uh, a lot of times those can be a good identifying feature, but if you find them past a certain age, they're probably gone or discolored, or there's only a couple there. Um, or they're going to be innate, having a feature with per that persists with age, kind of like the scales on a gymnopolis. So this is a gymnopolis fulvosquamulosus, and they will stay on there pretty much the entire time until it just turns to bush. It can be yeah, bellatunius. Uh, having the look and feel of velvet. So these tiny little hairs on here, this is a vulvariella. We have uh, one species out here, vulvariella bombacina. It grows on willows a lot that I've found. Um, it's a nice edible species, but almost all of them have a fuzzy cap like that. So if you find something with a fuzzy cap and it's got a vulva, it comes from an egg sac looking thing. And you can be pretty sure it's vulvariella. Uh, pubescent is like is similar, but it has shorter hairs. They're stiffer. Uh, I have that one coming up. Okay. Uh, glabrous, so bald or smooth, um, just lacking any real features. And flocculose, having small woolly cottony tufts or tomentose having densely woolly patches. So these are really terms. Oh, I didn't realize I had that one there. Sorry, for the uh, flocculose, that's going to be a big thing with coprinoids. So uh, mushrooms in the Satheriellaceae family, like caprinus, uh, coprinellus, and coprinopsis. Uh, they usually all have some sort of vellum on top, and you can get pretty far in identification just by looking at that and not having to see much else. Uh, prunois, so covered in fine powder like flour. Excuse me, this guy right here. That is um, another coprinopsis actually, so another ink cap. Or granulose, which is similar but it has larger particles resembling salt. So squamose is a scaly surface. Squamulose is smaller, scaly ones. Um, let's see. That's again like that gymnopolis I was talking about. And there's also a lot of uh, amanita that will have that feature. Perforaceous, covered in bran-like structures. So you're going to see that a lot with chlorophyllum, macrolepiota. Um, it's mainly lepiotoids. Fibrillose covered in hair. Um, it's very tiny. It's just kind of a fuzzy feeling. Like this one wasn't even really noticeable until I got my camera out. So sometimes you may have to look very closely. But here's suit, and that's the hexagonia hydnoides. You're going to have stiff, inflexible hairs. And then strigos is bristle-like hairs. So there's, a, I think, Panis trigellus, and that one has a very fuzzy stipe, and it's got little hairs all over it, and you can't really move them around much. They're, they're very bristly. So for the odors and taste, odors, we have unpleasant or disagreeable. It's a broad term, but it's useful if you can't identify anything specific about it. Um, even smell in and of itself is kind of a personal thing. It's a perception thing. So not everybody's going to smell the same thing. I know people who smell mushrooms all the time. They're like, this smells great. And I'm like, I smell nothing at all. So take all the odor things with a grain of salt. It may not be that important, but if you can smell something, it might help you a lot. So fragrant is used for sweet or pleasant smelling. Uh, anise is used to describe the smell of licorice, like black licorice. We have raffinoid for smells like a radish. 
Babacius smells like beans. And then some of the tastes we have mild used to describe many flavors, um, like mildly fruity or mildly fishy, peppery, spice like capsaicin, acrid, sharp, or harshly uh, flavored. And they can also be latent tastes. So you could take a bite, chew on it for a minute, and then not feel anything or taste anything for about 30 seconds, and then it just burns your mouth. Uh, real quick, I also want to go over uh, some genera and the smells associated with them as identifying features. So photid is smelling like uh, benzaldehyde, a chemical with a bitter almond odor. It's used as an additive in foods to give almond scent, I believe. Um, Michael Kuo from mushroomexpert.com describes it as a rotten maraschino cherry smell. But there's a, a group of Russula, or Russula that smell pretty interesting if you ever find them. Um, bleach and chlorine, uh, I usually see those split, but they smell the same to me. And they're, you know, comprised of the similar, like the same thing. Um, but that's associated with a species of Mycena, Amanita, and Merasmus. Ones that smell like anise or licorice is usually agaricus. So like your button mushrooms, similar to the portobello, white button, cremini, probably something else. Uh, certain species of inosibi smell like green corn. So it's that fresh kind of starchy smell. It's not entirely pleasant or unpleasant smell. Uh, apricots, this is said to be found in lots of chanterelles. I don't really ever smell it, but a lot of people describe it like that. I think at one point I may have just because I was like, it smells sweet. Only take when I've made ice cream with chanterelles, it's the only time it tastes to apricots. Yeah. Yeah. Makes everything taste good. <laughs> Uh, petroleum or gas, there are certain species of tricholoma that smell pretty nasty of like petroleum. We have fishy, which is in usually Rusula or Lactarius. I know there are some other that smell like that, but I don't have any off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that umami smell can get kind of fishy too, like even oyster or like pleuritus. So here is one more clue for the Guess the Mushroom win a book. Is this the book you recommend? Texas. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, the Bassettes have, I think they've authored over like 50 books or something like that. Um, they're, they're really good. They have a lot of books. It's all mainly for the East Coast. So up and down the East Coast, they have a book to take care of you. Um, but yeah, that's the most up-to-date one. There are a couple other ones still in print for Texas. Uh, they're, I think the Texas mushroom one, the white one, the Melzer one was printed in the 70s or 80s. So it's a little bit behind now. This one is really good. We've actually done a couple... Um, events with david lewis the uh third author there on the book and it's a really good guy so if he's ever doing an event with us again y'all should meet him staining and latex so for stains what's the color where is it how strongly is it staining how quickly and does it fade or fade to a different color so a lot of bolitz will stain. Um, so that's going to be a lot of different genera. Um, but blue is a very common one among them. Uh, also, species of psilocybe stain blue. Um, let's see, there are amanita that stain red, chlorophyllum that stain pink. Um, there, there's a lot of them. And for latex. So usually found in Lactarius or Lactifluus. Uh, 
what color, where, how much, how quickly does it appear, does it change color after time, and what does it taste like? That's just the inside, just the outside. Yeah, yeah. So I just broke that one open, and it starts to excrete that uh, dark blue liquid. Now, attachment of the gills. So, gills that are free are not connect, connected to the uh, stem whatsoever. So, they'll usually be somewhere in between here and here. Uh, but there's usually a little bit of space that makes it easy to tell. Add next is uh, narrowly attached to the stem. So, just barely. So, like this species of, I believe, Inosperma, I think this was, uh, they just barely touch like that. So it can almost look free, but you have to look a little bit deeper. They're sinuate, they're notched before attachment. So there are a lot of mushrooms that do that. Um, this one right here is a Gymnopolis species that we found on one of our walks. Um, and really, like a lot of species that do this, they can go from like Gymnopolis can be adnexed or attenuate. So that's not a great thing to look for. You need to read the descriptions and see what it transitions to. Like what's the, you know, one end of the spectrum to the other, basically. And then adnate is attaching widely to the stem. So if you imagine the cap like this and the stem right here, they just run straight across at 90 degrees. So if the gills are seceding, uh, they're usually breaking away from the stem or not connected. So right here, you can see on this one that as the cap started to expand, the gills would disconnect from the stipe. And it made it look almost free, um, but I had to go through about four or five different specimens to see that they were in fact not. If they are decurrent, the gills are gonna begin to run down the stem. And so this is a uh, species of Pleuritus right here, an oyster mushroom. And you can kind of see some cool features in the gills right there. It's almost cross veining, but not really. Uh, I think it's just wrinkled gills that stretch out when the mushroom fully grows. So the spacing of the gills can also be important. This is a distant, subdistant, close, and crowded. So a lot of Amanita are going to be close or crowded, Rusula usually. Um, the distant ones are usually going to be stuff like Little Mycena or uh, Merasmius or stuff in Merasmaceae. And some more gill features. So if the gills are smooth, that means they are uniform and uninterrupted. So just from margin to stipe. They can be serrated. And you can find that a lot in a species of lentinus or neolentinus. Um, one that's called the train wrecker. It grows from conifer stumps around here and it's a very hardy mushroom. It's been known to move things out of place when it's growing. I don't feel like those are the right ones for that. Oh, no, they're both used the same way. Okay. So, Crenate and Crist, regularly wavy or scalloped, or regularly wavy with small sweeps. And there are many, many mushrooms that do that. And undulating is regularly wavy with broad sweeps. So 
Excuse me, what do you mean by a scoop? Uh, so just like that, like kind of like a wave, it'll just have uh, longer or shorter intervals in between. So like, if you think about like a sine wave, basically like just longer or shorter, like increasing the frequency or not really. That's just the word they use. It's pretty much the same thing. Like some people may even use that word. I got all these from a old textbook that has uh, a David L. Argent book, which is really, really good. If anybody wants to spend a lot of money on eBay. So when the gills are marginate, that's where the edge is colored differently than the gill face. Um, see this in some species of Mycena, uh, Mycena leiana, which is a orange Mycena that will stain your hands, highlighter orange. Uh, it has, I want to say, darker gill faces, and then the edge is almost like a what do they call those uh, orange cream popsicles they used to make? Can't remember the name of those. Yes. So eroded, irregularly wavy, possibly torn. Um, it could be a feature that is innate in the mushroom or something that develops, but if it develops uh, consistently, it is a good feature to go by. And then fim fimbriate looks slightly fringed. So you can kind of see it along here. They got little specks all over it. Fimbriate. And you see that on a lot of like Amanita, especially ones that have, uh, or I've seen it a lot on the ones that have appendiculate margins where they have little remnants of the veil on them. All right. Lamellulae. Short gills not extending the entire length from margin to apex. So people usually just call them short gills. But you can see this one's got is that one, two, three, three tiers of different size gills. So bifurcate and furcate. So that's just two different types of splitting on the gills. Uh, if it's bifurcated, it's only going to split into two. Uh, if it's furcated, it's going to split or branch irregularly. So could be any number of splits along the uh, the gill. And anastomos, so that's cross-veining. You're going to see that a lot in species of uh, cantharellus. Uh, they get some really interesting features on there, but you can also see it on this one over here. It has tiny little ones all throughout, which is actually a defining feature of this genus, which is a, oh, they just changed it. It used to be Xeromphalina. Now it's hemiomyces or something. I can't remember. But a lot of uh, Marasmius and Gymnopus will have that as well. Onto the stipe. A centrally attached stem is going to be right in the middle. It's going to look very even. A lateral stem is going to be off to the side. And you'll see that a lot with um, Pleuritus species, oyster mushrooms, although they can and do grow centrally stipate, which is always fun to see. Uh, an eccentric is any attachment between lateral and central. All right. Inserted. Lacking any... Okay, so sorry. This is where the uh, stipe meets the substrate. So we're going to be looking at the very base of the mushroom and seeing if we can find anything there that will help us identify it. So if it's inserted, it's lacking any unique features, and there's not really anything you can see. This one's just going straight into wood. Basal tomentum. So fuzzy hyphae at the base. Uh, this is a species of boletus or orobolitus or something like that. 
Uh, it has yellow mycelium at the bottom and it kind of goes up a little bit past the dirt. You can see it uh, right at the base before you pull it up. Pseudoriza. This is sometimes called radicated, I think. Um, but basically these were in the ground to about right there. And all that underneath was rooting. And that's a common feature among mushrooms like uh, Zerula, like this one, or Hymenopelis, or Odomanciella, which are all very, very similar. And rhizomorphs, they're long, cord-like, semi-elastic structures. Um, oftentimes, you'll find that the armillaria that has the glow in the dark. Um, rhizomorphs it has the black ones. I know that. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that I don't know the um, I know it's a mycelium. Mm. But not the rhizomorphs. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they'll. Um, so sometimes if you pick a mushroom and you pull on it, you'll see a little cord like structure. And if you very carefully follow that down, you can find it attached to stuff. So this one was a gymnopus I found growing off of a live oak acorn. Uh, it actually scared me very bad when I pulled it out because I didn't see it and it like swung down and hit my hand. And I was like, ah. <laughs> but yeah sometimes you'll see them on trees and they're just black little knots growing all around them the shape of the stipe so if it's equal that means it'll be the same from top to bottom usually it can be more or less equal or equal. It's very hard to have something that's perfectly equal, but if it's bulbous, the stipe will be thickened at the end, like this Cortinaria species right here. And if it has like a distinct margin or ring around the top of the bulb, it's going to be called marginate or a marginate bulb. tapered for anything getting gradually thicker one direction or the other. So it can be going towards the stipe or towards the base. Or sorry, towards the cap or towards the base. And clavate having the appearance of a club. So a pretty simple one. All right, here's another clue. All right. That one didn't work right. All right. So, stipe, surface, and features. A lot of species of uh, suillus, which are a type of bolete, will have uh, glandular dots on them. So, they're tiny little dark colored specks. And if they have a texture to them that's kind of rough, then it's usually called scabrous because they have they will actually like form into little points. The stipe can be longitudinally striate. So it'll have fine lines running equidistance longitudinally. Um, you'll see that a lot in gliophorus like this. And I guess not just entoloma, but entoloma CA or whatever it is. Um, they a lot of them have a, a twisty stipe, and so that's a good defining feature for entoloma if you find one. And reticulation. So I don't know that I've ever seen this on anything other than boletes. Um, and the pattern kind of follows the same pattern that the pores follow, and some of them will even have reticulation going all the way up to the apex of the stipe and then lead into 
the pores almost how uh, like the current gills run down a stem. So it kind of continues that pattern out. But yeah, like a python or a giraffe, and they're all different colors. The consistency of the stipe. So it can feel like cartilage, having a thin stipe that breaks cleanly when bent. So you'll get just the tiniest bit of give out of it, and then it'll just snap, kind of like a cooked chicken tendon. Uh, fibrous, having a thick stipe does, that does not break cleanly. I like think celery. Chalky, having a consistency of chalk becoming granular when crushed. And woody, corky, and leathery, having the consistency of wood, cork, or leather. So that's usually a lot of polypores like that. Um, they range anywhere from you know, cardboard to wood, as far as how hard they are. And the stipe can be solid, lacking any cavities inside, or hollow all the way through like a straw. And stuffed, which is kind of an intermediate state. So it's lightly packed mycelium on the inside. So it's kind of fluffy in the hollow space. And that's what they call stuffed. And on the stipe, some mushrooms are going to have a veil or an annulus. So it can be membranaceous, which is a veil that leaves uh, patches of concentric circles on the stipe as it grows. It can be superior, which is above the midway point of the stipe, central, middle, or inferior, which is down low. I meant to do that one for the membranaceous one. And the rings themselves can be attached or movable. So a lot of uh, a lot of species that have rings, they will be firmly attached. Uh, but there are some like Macrolepiota and some Chlorophyllum that the you will find them sometimes, and the ring has fallen to the bottom. It's just free floating there. And sometimes the veil is a spider web like consistency. And that's going to be usually your Cortinarius, Gymnopolis, and a few other species. How did that one get in the back? All right. So the regular veil just kind of protects the gills as the mushroom is growing until it gets to the point where it starts producing spores, it usually breaks the veil around that time and releases them. A universal veil is basically like an egg sac that the entire mushroom is covered in before it grows out. So it's going to be a lot of species like Amanita, Vulvariella, Vulvoplutus. Um, I'm sure there's some others. I just can't think of them right now. I think some coprinoids, yeah. Some ink caps. But the veil itself, or I'm sorry, the vulva itself, can be adherent. The tissue is difficult to remove. It can be free, mostly free from the base, not tightly compacted around it. Loose, almost like a bag. So if you think of a empty bag with like one little thing in it, and the bag's kind of like falling over. It's very loose. I don't know how to describe that one, but. Uh, do, 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 and it can be saccate and membranous, so it can be strong and loose. If they are limbate, that means they're going to have an appendage-like section due to splitting or tearing. So it'll like have a little arm off to one side and then just a short part on the other. They can be flared at the top or circumcisile, which think about like a little drawstring bag. It'll just be tighter at the top. They can be zoned with visible ring zones along its length. So that's like um, some of the muscaroids, I think, like Kasawi and uh, 
I can't remember all the different muscariot names. And we have scaly, which is similar to zoned, but irregular in occurrence. And pharynos, having a powdery appearance. Do, do, do. So their growth, they can be growing solitarily by themselves, singly. Sesmatos, growing from the same micellial mass. So they'll look clustered, but if you pull them apart, they're going to break at the bottom and you'll see that they're all coming from one central piece. Gregarious is closely grouped together. So if you peel these apart, they would separate easily and you would see that they aren't actually connected. There's no interwoven hyphae there or hyphae. Okay. And scattered group bodies are within a few feet of each other. Um, this can be a particularly important feature. Like this one right here is Copernopsis Um And for the longest time, I thought it was Copernopsis variegata, but the only difference really, or the main difference that people pointed out to me is that one is cespitos and the other grows gregariously. So spore colors, uh, real quick, I just want to say, um, take spore prints if you want to. It may or may not help. Uh, a lot of the times after you've been doing it for a little bit, you can check the gills themselves and see what color they're going to be turning or what color they have turned. Um, but if you, you know, do any microscopy or anything or just want to collect them, um, you know, absolutely nothing wrong with it. But the spore color, we're going to have, we have brown colors, blue colors, red colors, orange colors, all sorts of different ones. But for a lot of the stuff that grows in this area, I just kind of threw them into little groups. So brown spore stuff, uh, agaricus, bulbidius, gallerina, canosabi, foliota. A lot of white spored ones. We have Amanita, Omphalatus, Armillaria, Sumclatosity, and Lapista, Lusopaxillus, and Pleurida species. And then the black ones, black or dark colored, Paneolus, Sathriella, Caprinus, Capronellus, Capronopsis, Psilocybe, Stropharia, Hyphaloma. Again, this is something you can view on the mushroom itself. So a lot of people make a point of taking spore prints, but you can. It's just, I find it to be an unnecessary step. Okay, so when you're out and you want to collect something, you want to make sure that <clears throat> you collect the whole specimen. Uh, if it's firmly attached to the substrate, just go ahead and cut off a little piece of the substrate if you can. So if it's on bark, take that piece of bark off. If it's um, in a tightly compacted clump of dirt or something, you know, just take a little bit with you. It's not going to hurt anything and it'll probably be better for identification purposes. Uh, you want to start drying it as soon as possible unless you're going to be doing something like microscopy because um, it's a little easier to do it when they're fresh. Um, but a good place to do that is on the dash of your car. I just started doing that because Alan does it, and I was like, wow, this is very effective. Yeah, but now I have gymnopolis spores all over my dash. Uh, and paper bags are excellent short-term storage. I know some people who actually dry their mushrooms out and then throw them back in paper bags and just put a little desiccant pack in there and they have never had any issues. Um, but he probably keeps them in a larger container outside of that. All right, and for documentation, you wanna include multiple angles. You wanna include natural lighting uh, a lot of times people will send pictures to us from their kitchen or their living room and they have incredibly warm toned lights and they'll show you something and it 
has no discernible colors. It's just kind of brown. And pictures in C2. So that's in its natural environment. Uh, there's a lot we can gain from looking at that, um, especially if you don't particularly pay attention to it, then you go back and you can see, oh, there's uh, pine needles underneath and there's oak leaves there. So I know it's in mixed woods. Um, it, it can be very helpful to have those pictures. All right. And I didn't really expect to get through this that quickly, but we got a couple more and then we can do some Q and A. Uh, so going further, um, a lot of species have very similar macro characteristics. Uh, for instance, I think we have about 50 red capped white stemmed Russula in North America. Um, and so if you wanted to tell any of them apart, you would need to do something with microscopy or send it in to get sequenced. I wish I had the money to send everything I found in and get sequenced because then I would know for sure and there wouldn't be any human error on my side. But that does take money and time. What is, what is the sequence? Uh, they're sequencing the uh, DNA on it. Yes, sir. And um, I don't know. Someone showed me a slide recently. A majority of type species for uh, genera are not even, uh, haven't been sequenced yet, which is kind of interesting. Uh, on average, about $10 per sample. Um, and I think I was told it's um, like roughly 1500 or so to get your own setup to do it yourself. Um, we have connection. Well, we have, we still have her. Is she still here? Liz? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so we have a connection at UT. Um, I know a few people personally who, who do it though. I've never sent one out though. I haven't really had a reason to yet. Um, but it's, it's not that hard to do. Uh, they have a couple of websites. I could probably find the links to that. Give you step-by-step -step processes for it. Uh, and if you want to get involved in some other stuff, we're going to have the Great North American Fungi Quest. So from thinkfungi.org, this is a, uh, they call it a bio blitz, right? Mm -hmm. So through the 15th to the 18th, they're pushing for people to take as many observations as possible of mushrooms and upload them to Nature Spots, Mushroom Observer, iNaturalist, Questagame, observation.org, and sitsci.org. Um, I'm not entirely familiar with quest a game, but it seems like a very gamified, like I naturalist. Yeah. Um, and all you have to do to participate is take pictures and upload them. Like there's not anything else you have to do. You don't have to sign up or anything. Um, but they're hoping to have the biggest one ever. <laughs> Yeah. And then I wanted to throw up all those pictures, see if anybody has any guesses or any questions about this one. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Um, so we're since we're doing this on the um the Zoom and in person, we probably I'm trying to think of how how do we get the timing of the first person? Because usually on Zoom we'll do like first person to answer the question, like put it in the mm. chat which takes more time than screaming it out. <laughs> so I'm like, maybe we do two prizes. Like, Everybody get out your phones. Yeah, yeah, we could do like, um, yeah, we don't have one of those like phone app things. But, mm -hmm. but, uh, but we could do, um, we could do two prizes. We could do the book for online. So there's a lot more people on the online and we could give away a hat here. And everybody agree with that? You want to give a hand <laughs> um, So I won't tell the answer of like, you know, whoever decides it on the um, on the Zoom until we get an answer from both. Nope. Does that sound okay? Yep. Okay. All right. So. All right. Well, I went through that a little quicker than I expected. So let's do some Q and A. Yes, sir. Oh. Um, can you repeat it back to so people on Zoom can hear you? So like the app. Yeah. Is there a, an app 
that it's a little bit quicker than putting it on one of these websites that's somewhat reliable. Are you talking about a like ID? like one that'll ID it for you by picture? Yeah. Okay. So he just asked if there is a reliable app or anything that's better than having to go to these websites, submit them, and then wait for somebody to possibly give you an answer or maybe not even at all. Uh, and the answer is yes and no. Those apps have gotten a lot better. They surprise me sometimes. And I think they can be a good starting point. Um, like iNaturalist. iNaturalist. Uh, what's the Google one that does? Yeah, Google Lens. Yeah, yeah. The the recommender. Uh not that I've found. Yeah, a lot of times it'll it'll tell you something similar or it'll just say like a Garrick. Um, but they are getting better and it's a good starting point. Like it can give you don't take it as correct right away. Always back that up by like you know, researching yourself. Because sometimes it will be correct, and it surprised me a few times. But yeah, a lot of the times it's not. But it can be close. Ones that people document, you know. But but if you you know really start to get deep in the woods, mm. look around, you're gonna find. Well, that goes down to the AI's learning capabilities. Like it's all based off of how much information they have. So with that micro blitz or the bio blitz coming up, we all go out and take a bunch of pictures, and we can find some uh, under reported or under observed species and add those to the list and the ai is going to get better at just telling somebody it's that automatically anybody else uh, some questions on oh. the chat on the chat on sorry we'll do one on one um let's see there was another lab see. anybody else have any newer questions there was one about um, latex. Uh, so this kind of backs up a little bit when we're talking about the lactarius species. Mm -hmm. Is that poisonous? Um, no. Assuming the latex. No. Um, the only issues I've ever really heard are that if you get a hold of a spicy mushroom and taste the latex on it and you aren't expecting it, it can be just as spicy as the mushroom would be. Um, but no, there's there's no poisonous latex that I'm aware of, at least from Lactarius and Lax Okay, any other questions? We, out got, there on we got this guy right here. Yes, sir. So my question is, is you covered the life cycle of mushrooms. Um, whenever they release the spores, are they creating clones of themselves? How do mushrooms like, increase the genetic diversity? Like, so might they think that uh, there are other of the same species of mushrooms that are in the same area, and perhaps they're all releasing their spores at the same time. And those spores release are airborne, and do they like mingle together? And that's kind of how they kind of keep genetic diversity, or, or am I to assume that it's just clones whenever they release their spores? Well, you got to think of it as a uh, like offspring. So if somebody were to grow a mushroom and they're like, this is this strain and they gave you spores from that one and you grew those, it would be a different one because each spore is gonna have different genetic information in it and only two compatible ones if it's uh, dimetic or what, not dimetic, uh, diploid. Um, I think, I'm not really sure on that one, on the biology of that part, but if they are compatible, then they'll mate and they'll continue. And so basically with millions and millions of spores, like something will be compatible with the high fear mycelium that's already there and so they just put a little bit out, spread it, that grows, connects to the bigger organism, and then it just keeps going. Um, so we had a question on the chat about, um, we didn't get super deep into microscopy, but someone asked, what is the magnification that's needed for a fungal microscopy? And also, um, what kind of tools, chemicals are needed? And, um, and also, uh, what good books you recommend for microscopy? uh what is that i have one book on microscopy one second
Roland. Can I see the chat on the screen? You can. So if you want to stop sharing too, it'll um, be easier. So I think if you go, let's see. Let's see. Okay. You're in like a speaker view kind of thing. Um, it's like over here on this side. There we go. Oh, we only shows it. We can move this over to you. Over here. Sorry, guys. Bending you guys had to look at that bar the whole time. Could have moved it. There you go. Oh, sweet. Okay. Do, do, do. So the only book I have ever gotten on microscopy is Introduction to Light Microscopy by... D. Lawler. L-A-W-L-O-R. So they're pretty simple. If you've ever used a camera or know the basics of a camera, how the lens works, um, it's pretty much exactly the same. Um, it's very simple and it seems a little bit harder than it actually is to get started. Um, but you will need a microscope with at least a thousand times magnification and oil immersion lens. Uh, so usually they just go up to, I think, 400, and then you have your oil immersion lens, um, which gives you a thousand times magnification. Um, as far as like chemicals or anything, you can purchase, I think they have it pre-made, I've never bought it, but uh, potassium hydroxide, um, KOH, uh, that's the main mounting liquid or medium that you want to use. Um, there are some other ones that are a little bit harder to get hold of, like Congo Red or Melser's Reagent, uh, because that has some of the same stuff that's in, I think, like GHB or some <laughs> controlled substance. Um, but if you know a mycologist, they may be able to get it for you. I know plenty of people who have. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. All right. I think that answered everything on that one. Uh, any other questions we missed on the Zoom or anything else we have here? So we'll do our trivia. And there's a question with this one. Oh, was it? Ask it. Hmm? There's a question that didn't come this too, right? Oh, I just, what? what's the mushroom? Oh, okay. Guess the mushroom, oh, yes, win the, the book. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, first person to raise their hand here or in the chat to name that mushroom, mm -hmm. we'll get a copy of the um, Mushrooms of the Gulf States field guide. Then we can come up with a new question if that was too challenging. Oh. I, you didn't say you had to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, he's right. Is it the pink gilly mushroom? Pink yeah. gilly mushroom? Something? This oh, one is. He's got pretty tough. I did. Seek said it was a mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> that is is not correct, unfortunately, on this one. Uh, let's see. Let's see if there's any good tips I can give her hints. Yeah, no, no, he's just like inside of your like using your guide or yeah, or what you learned today. All the like, new words. I may have I may have pointed out some features and said they go with a certain genera that this one may or may not be in. So Jay says cone cap, but we're looking for Latin, right? I don't even know what I, the Latin. That's, I don't know the common that's names. Just, that's just like a real generic name. Um, do you have a, what about like if we ask the um, broader, like the citizens, like the larger uh, group? Yeah. Because uh, we didn't know something. No, I didn't want to get too much into that because 
Maybe I started yeah. to, and it just went forever because mm-hmm. there's so many weird nuances to taxonomy yeah. and it confuses me and I don't want to bother Jacob Holt all the time. Yeah, yeah. Should we ask what our Sure. Okay. Oh. <laughs> it's ma'am. Uh, Oh, yeah. uh, you have a question or no. do they answer? Yeah. Okay, so the, we wanted to ask um, the first person in the chat to put the name in Latin of our state mushroom um, will win the book. And the person that says it up, raises their hand first and says it here today will win a hat. Okay. Oh, yeah. Did you, did you ask, like, with the state mushroom? Yes. Uh, isn't it the star mushroom? Yeah. It's on my hat. It's on my hat. Yeah. It's in our logo as well. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and share it with everyone. No, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, we got a common name on the chat. Well, no one wants to learn. Get the feel. Okay. The <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. All right. You're going to have to. What's the name of our state mushroom? Uh-oh. Devil cigar is the um the devil cigar is the common name. We need a we need an actual Latin. Latin binomial. Okay, all right, Jay. You won. <laughs> okay. It's misspelled, but we get you. <laughs> he was in a hurry. He's like, yeah. I gotta get this. All right, yes, another question. That is extremely close, though, because this is what's called a lepiotoid or lepiotoid. Um, so is it the red staining lepiotoid? It's one of them. Yeah, I don't know all of them, especially Latin. Y'all don't feel bad. <laughs> I don't know Latin very well. I think it used to be <laughs> Lepiota, and then they split it into a bunch of other ones. So it became uh, Macro Lepiota, Chlorophyllum, Luso Agaricus, Luso Caprinus, uh, not Cystoderma, something else. Hey. Well, thank you all for learning with us tonight. And I know there's a lot of new words and it might seem intimidating, but this is recorded and on our YouTube channel, so you can always go back. I think it's fun to learn all of these words. I hear them when I'm out with experts in the field. Um, and it's it's fun to actually see it and then use it as well. Um, so yeah, so definitely like go back and continue, continue to learn. Um, but yeah, is there anything else you want to say to wrap things up? Um, really, a lot of the words, like you don't have to remember the exact word itself. If you can remember what it was talking about and somehow describe it in Google, like it'll probably bring you around to the correct thing. Yeah. Like a lot of, like even a lot of Facebook groups for identification stuff, they won't use a lot of the Latin terminology. But if you get deep into it and you start reading like research papers or mm-hmm. any published species or anything like that, it's going to be like a second language and you're basically just going to be like, uh-huh. And that means, yeah. and I mean, just if you can remember the broad description of them, that's, that's the best thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. So once you start learning how to identify the mushrooms and uh, sort of harvesting, like for edible mushrooms, like turkey tail and lion's mane and spaceship and things like this, what are some of the best practices out in the field so that you know like wipe out an entire area? Um, so it is actually very difficult for someone in Texas, I believe, to do that much damage. I know there are mushrooms on the red list here and that there are laws against foraging in most of the parks. 
Um, but for the most part, it takes like there's commercial foragers in like the Pacific Northwest and they'll take like, you know, those five gallon wicker baskets on their back and fill those up. Um, really, I would just say not more than you could eat for the foreseeable future. Like there's not any exact number I have. Um, it's really just use your best judgment. Like sometimes it's okay to take everything that's there. Like if you're harvesting the mushrooms, it's not damaging the mycelial mass any, it's just the fruit body. It's like an apple. Um, like vegetative part. Yeah. You might want to take into account what kind of area it is, if they're going to be doing construction or expanding out somewhere and Maybe that mushroom isn't found anywhere else. You know, let it go for a little while. And there's actually been studies that show, um, like agitating the mycelium like that causes it to like you know have a little growth spurt, basically. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Kind of considering where, where it is in the life cycle too, um, you know, make sure you leave some. Yeah, if they're all immature, too. like if they haven't opened up, you definitely want to. I know a lot of people with reishi, for example, they'll take just like a little piece of it because um, it goes pretty far, like as far as um, extracting the medicine from it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, if you could just take just a part of the reishi shell. Yeah. No, um, a lot of polypores will connect right into the uh, the substrate of wherever it's growing from, and then there are some that are, I bet you could call them just stipe, like that's all there is. It's just a little, like coral fungus or club fungus. Yes, yeah, so a lot of those, well, actually, some of them are the Um So the spore bearing surface, they're going to release spores in different ways. So, like guild mushrooms have basidia, and those grow the spores and they project them off. Whereas a lot of um, like cup fungi and little stuff like that, they're going to be asos. And instead of having basidia that grow spores, they grow these like long tubes that hold usually about eight spores in them. And then those are ejected later on. But yeah, it it's different for each one pretty much. Like there are some that you wouldn't expect to be or have basidia and they do. Uh, so we had another question on the Zoom about the newbies, um, you know, what, what we'd recommend. So we do a mycology 101 where we don't do this kind of deep dive on identification. So if you want to learn kind of the general, just general things about mycology, and um, it's it's a presentation I put together. So I kind of put it together, sort of like um, thinking about the things that made me like really fascinated by fungi. So it's it's got a lot of different applications, um, of how people are using fungi, um, but it really tells you about the life cycle, it's um, uh, importance in our ecosystem. And we put all of our classes online on our YouTube channel. So smash the like button, subscribe. Um, yeah, so yeah, if you uh, are wanting to do a deep dive and we're doing more walks as we get rain. So um, I was mentioning earlier, we don't plan our walks out far in advance. Usually we have to look at the forecast, which usually is just 10 days and that is always changing too. So it's kind of a crapshoot in this uh, droughty kind of weather. Clouds get closer to us and they're like, eh. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are planning a walk um, to Big Thicket in the fall um, in November with Alan Rockefeller. And I think we're going to go on Halloween, like actual Halloween. Um, so, you know, we'll be doing night walks, all kinds of things. Um, so look out for announcements on that. We're also going to be doing a microscopy, microscopy class with him. Um, I don't know where yet. That's why I haven't put any tickets up or, you know, it's also November. I'm like, 
planning months out in advance, but yeah, it's it's around the corner. Um, but yeah, and if you haven't had a chance to try chicken of the woods, um, if there's some left, uh, get a little sample on the table. And thanks everybody for coming out, and thanks Mason for giving us a deep dive. <laughs> Yes, so many new words in my that I need to learn. <laughs> I was going back through them and I was like, I, I always just describe this word. I never use this word. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Thank you.